Two minutes and 25 seconds remaining. It's a cliffhanger here from Ann Arbor. A barn burner, call it what you will. Wide to the right is Bo Rather. It's Taylor deep and Cypress close. Larry Sippa under center in a balanced line. Sippa rolls out to the right. Pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. Michigan leads 9-7. Hi, this is Deborah Holchik, editor of Michigan Today, or should I say, a Michigan Today. That was legendary Wolverines football announcer Bob Eufer you just heard, basically losing his mind as All-American Billy Taylor scored a touchdown to beat Ohio State in 1971. Me, Michigan football is a religion, and Saturday is the holy day of obligation, Eufer often would say during his Michigan broadcasting career. And that career spanned 362 consecutive games from 1945 through 1981. It took a terminal illness to break that streak. Eufer called his last game at Iowa in 1981, and he passed away soon after. He was only 61 years old. But even now, nearly 40 years after he left the airwaves, Eufer's spirit survives among the Michigan faithful. Filmmaker Dan Chase, 1983 graduate, is one of those fervent faithful. He was one of those people who turned down the TV and turned up the radio just to hear Eufer call the games. On Friday, October 5th, Dan will screen his documentary, Football's Valhalla, the Bob Eufer story, at the Michigan Theater. It's a total love fest, jammed with unseen footage and photographs, interviews with coaches, players, fans, and family, even English professor Ann Curzon here at U of M, who breaks down some of Bob's nuttiest euphorisms and unique turns of phrase. So if you're free this Friday, get down to the Michigan. In the meantime, let's go behind the scenes of football spell Hella with one of Eufer's biggest fans. Here's Dan. I think I was probably about seven or eight years old, and my mother was listening to Bob Eufer on a little portable radio that she would carry around the house. And she'd be doing housework and she'd have this radio on and I was thinking, well, why on earth is my mother listening to a football game? This is, you know, sports. I didn't think of her as being a sports fan in particular. And what I learned was that she was listening to him as an entertainer. She loved, she loved like folk writers and, uh, you know, Mark Twain kind of writers and uh, writers that had a wry sense of humor and had a personality. She was she was entertained by all of his euphorisms and <laughs> all of his funny phrases and his, you know, I'm sure just his sheer joy. And and then as a little kid who loved sports, uh, you've got you've got the entertainment factor plus the fact that he's talking about Michigan football and he's telling that story and. Uh, you know, for, for most fans in Ann Arbor, that was the, that was the, the pr preferred choice, I guess, for, uh, for following Michigan football. Mm -hmm. The one that I was probably my favorite is uh, running down that mod sod like a penguin with a hot herring in his cummerbund. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I have Ann Curzan <laughs> breaking that down. <laughs> so cute. She's great. She says something like, well, let's start with mod sod. <laughs> You know, and proceeds to, you know, kind of work through it. You know, where do you get, where do you get the penguin? Where do you get the hot herring? You know, I, so that, that's a fun, you know, that's one of my favorites that's fun. But there's, you know, there's so many others. He could run in the phone booth for 15 minutes and never touch the sides. And I tried to listen to as many of the game broadcasts as I could. And, and, uh. And I was really listening not so much for football highlights, but for funny expressions or historical expressions, mm -hmm. especially if he was talking about his own life or childhood, let's say. There was one that he used, which was, he, he just threw it out. He said, um, well, everybody makes mistakes. That's why they put rubber mats under cuspidors. <laughs> and that one just kind of slipped by. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm not sure I even know what a cuspidor is. I gotta go look it up. And it's a spittoon. <laughs> But, you know, I'm like, now that's a little dated, uh, even in 1975 or whatever it was. Uh, aside from the euphorisms and kind of those funny expressions, also a big thing with Bob Eufer was nicknames. He nicknamed a lot of the players, which also made them kind yeah. of more legendary. Rick Leach, the guts and glue of the maize and blue, uh, you know, Anthony the darter carter. <laughs> 
all these things uh, added to his flavor and, and helped to you know, magnify these heroes that we were following. Talk about an enthusiastic character. I mean, what a time for Michigan football and for, for the fans to experience it. I mean, it makes a big difference when the person calling the game is really loving their job, and he really did. One of the interesting things about Bob Eufer we try to cover in the film is that uh, he was a broadcaster for Michigan football games beginning in 1945, so he had been at Michigan broadcasting on kind of a small scale for 25 years before Bo Schembechler even arrived. But when Bo arrived and started having success for the team, and, and of course that, that juiced up the fans, but it also juiced up Bob Eufer. And really the 10-year the war that Bo had with Woody really parallels the peak of Bob Eufer's career, in my opinion, which was really 11 or 12 years before his death. And Eufer rode that wave with Michigan in those years and was really a big part of it, uh, along with Don Canham, in my opinion, you know, in building up the Michigan program, building up Bo Schembechler, uh, making heroes, you know, larger than life figures out of the players and coaches. So he was, he was really a, a core part of it. Who are some of the people that you've spoken to that our audience will recognize? I know you've, you've got Harbaugh in there. Yes, Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh was someone uh, who was a terrific surprise uh, to me. I, I, I think of Jim Harbaugh as a, as a younger guy or as a kid because I grew up in Ann Arbor and we had some, you know, we had some mutual connections through the Minics that, who were in our neighborhood and stuff. So <laughs> I vaguely knew of Jim Harbaugh, but I always thought of him as a, as a little kid, you know. But in talking with him, I realized, oh, he has very, not only does he have very vivid memories of Bob Eufer's broadcast, but he was very direct in saying that Bob Eufer was an influence mm -hmm you know, an actual, real influence on how he developed as a boy and as a young man in terms of his enthusiasm mm -hmm. for Michigan. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that, that Jim was growing up in a household with, with a dad who was a coach for Michigan at that time, Jack Harbaugh, only magnified that. You know, other things uh, related to Bob Eufer that he said were were beautiful. One of the things he said that I didn't even have to ask him about is he said, I always wished that Bob Eufer had called one of my games because Jim Harbaugh came in as a quarterback about a year after Bob oh. Eufer had passed away. So he never had that oh, opportunity and so that was close. a regret. Um, but but to, uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, so Jim Harbaugh, very important interviewee. His father, Jack, is a tremendously articulate guy, a passionate guy, mm -hmm. uh, was, was contributed great material for the film. Other coaches, uh, Lloyd Carr, uh, didn't know, hadn't met Lloyd Carr, uh, and was delighted, um, was so delighted to have him. He's also a, a passionate person. He understands emotion and uh, he remembers Eufer vividly and he was at the, the 1981 Rose Bowl where Bob Eufer made a very special speech uh, and then Bo went out and proceeded to win his first bowl game, which was a big deal. And, and Lloyd Carr was also there in 1981 when Bob Eufer made his final appearance. Um, Jerry Hanlon. Jerry Hanlon was in my first film. He's a charming guy. He's a beloved figure in Michigan athletics and in the community. And one of the funny things is whenever I show the Billy Taylor film, it seems that whenever women see the film, they go, who was that cute? Who was that cute old guy? <laughs> Chicks dig Jerry Hanlon. I, and so, I, of course, for the female viewers, I had to put Jerry Hanlon in this film as well. Is there any explanation in the movie about his, uh, where his Michigan came from? Yeah, that's a standard piece of, of Michigan lore. And uh, the story with that is that when Bob Eufer came here to Michigan, he came in 19, the fall of 1939. He, he initially had dreams of playing football at Michigan, so he was playing freshman football in 1939. He was coached by Wally Weber, but certainly Fritz Chrysler would have been around and would have been aware of this speedy kid from Pennsylvania. Uh, but, but then I'm sure that winter, uh, Bob began training for track, which was his other passion, his other 
excellent standout sport. And in the process of that training, the legend is, is that they were at Yoast Fieldhouse working out and running, and that uh, Fielding Yoast would be hanging out. The athletes would stop by and they'd sit with Yoast and he would tell them stories which he apparently remembered quite vividly mm -hmm. of his glory days and different exploits of Michigan teams from the really, really early years. And so uh, the legend is that you, for, as, a, as a freshman athlete, was listening to those stories. And Fielding Yost was from West Virginia. Oh, okay. And the story was that as he would regale these kids with his stories about the good old days, he would refer to Michigan with his southern accent as Michigan. Okay. And so he kept saying Michigan, Michigan. <laughs> and it was just, he wasn't trying to, you know, put anything on. That was just, a, that was his southern accent coming through. Uh, and, and, uh, and Eufer remembered that and, and picked up on that. And, and that, that has been perpetuated, you know, to this day. You know, one of the details that, that I find interesting is that Bob Eufer is buried about 10 feet away from where Fielding Yost is buried. Cool. And at the, uh, the high point in Forest Hill Cemetery here in Ann Arbor. Did not know that. Beautiful location, and uh, Fielding Yost chose a good location, and it's my belief that Bob Eufer wanted to be very, very close to Fielding Yost. The connection, I would say, the personal connection, besides, you know, enjoying him on the radio as a kid like, like so many uh, kids did, is that I was an undergrad at Michigan when Eufer became ill and uh, was happened really by chance to go to the Iowa game in 1981 where Bob Eufer made his last appearance. And it was emotional for the crowd uh, because they suddenly realized, I think many of them suddenly realized that he was seriously ill and that he was going to die mm -hmm. soon and that this was his chance to say a final farewell. I get choked up. Ugh. Yeah, that's um, intense. And, you know, I had um, my mother, this my mother who had introduced me to Bob Eufer, really, had passed from cancer about four years before this. So I think I was still sensitive about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now here's this guy that, oh. uh, that we were, you know, that we were so fond of. And we had, you know, all of my friends, you know, everybody knows about this. The game watches where you would turn the TV volume down but the radio would always be on. You'd always have, that was, <laughs> that was the way to watch those games. Yeah. So, so that was a, a very emotional moment. I've tried to talk, I've talked to various people uh, that I've interviewed in the film about that moment. And it was a very dramatic, very emotional uh, moment. And for me, it's probably the moment that fueled the making of this film. The other thing that's great about um, college sports and then when you have a character like you for, um, how much it belongs to everyone as an alum. In talking with all of these people um, about Michigan and about love for Michigan, you know, what's, what I've learned is that the legacy is really remarkable. It really is what distinguishes this university, this football program, is the richness and, and, and depth and, and, mm -hmm. and length of, of, this, of this tradition, of this history. And Fielding Yost and Fritz Chrysler were, were giants, you know, in, in, in foot, college football nationally, not just here. So we have that at Michigan, yeah. which is great. And Bob Eufer was really a bridge from the past to the present. That is a, a strong feeling I have for the film, that Bob Eufer met and spoke with Fielding Yost when he was alive as an athletic director. And then Bob Eufer is around uh, chronicling uh, and broadcasting Michigan football and is able to influence somebody named Jim Harbaugh who mm -hmm. as a little boy then develops and grows and now becomes a football coach carrying on the same tradition and uh, I've always felt that uh, what's important is to draw the positives from someone's life and to, and to really uh, carry that forward so certainly it's my hope that the story of Bob Eufer is going to be a reminder to people of the kind of enthusiastic, positive choices you can make in your life. It's such a kick to be able to see footage that you haven't seen in a long time or may never have seen or to, to just to see them alive again, I think will be just a real joy for people. It's true. One of the great things about 
building a documentary is that you get to do that kind of research and you're you're really looking for video where you can find it you're looking for photos where you can find them and it's been a it's been a, a, a joy to uncover uh, images both moving and still a lot of people don't know that Bob Eufer was a not just a varsity track athlete at Michigan but a world record holder in the quarter mile so he was a serious serious athlete um, but this intern came back to me and said well I found something and you know I don't know if you're going to like it I hope it's okay and what it turned out to be was an intact race shot in Madison Square Garden with two different cameras filmed <laughs> nice and it, it shows an entire race <laughs> for the most part that Bob Eufer ran Jack and won. Jack I shouldn't get shouldn't five. give shouldn't give away the fact that he won the race. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to hold that back. Oh well, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but it, it's it's everything I could have hoped for in terms of of being able to show clearly. Here's Bob Eufer running, mm -hmm. and yes, he is fast, and and yes, yes, he beat everybody by a mile, <laughs> and and that and that was a find. That was a find that. No other, you know, no other Michigan fan, you know, and there's many, many of them that love to collect this stuff. Nobody's got that yet. No one, no one has seen that yet. So I get, to sh I get to share that. Score! In researching his story and starting to talk to the family and, and read about him, uh, you learn that there was much, much more to it. He was divorced, which was a painful thing that happened and, and sort of seems... You know, you kind of go, wow, I don't think of him as someone. Mm -hmm. How could Bob Eufer ever get divorced? Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> he had a father, Clarence Eufer, who was a track, also a track mm. standout at Michigan. And and Clarence Eufer struggled with the Great Depression, ended up becoming an alcoholic, and, and died also prematurely. But this is a, you know, these are, they're, they're, these are details where you suddenly go, wow. Bob Eufer, when he came to Michigan, was his family was fairly affluent, but uh, early in his student career, his, his father went bankrupt. Wow. And the family suddenly had no more money, and, and apparently Eufer's tuition check bounced. Uh, and, and he had to start scrambling, as many students do, to pay their way through school and figure out a way to make it work. So that colors the way you look at Bob Eufer, and he's not just this happy clown on, on a broadcast that many people, that's all they know. Mm -hmm. But it will be sentimental. I would say as an artist, you know, a direction that I want to go is to tell stories that are sentimental, that, that do pull at the heartstrings, mm -hmm. that celebrate what's, what's joyful and sad in the same breath, if that's possible. Um, but beyond that, you know, laughter is essential, you know, and, and laughter paired with tragedy is, is pretty exquisite if you can pull that mm -hmm. off. Um, and, and that's, I think, what I hope to do. Bob Eufer had a huge sense of humor. Yeah. He was a funny person. And the film has to have humor. And we, <laughs> we we're, trying to build, we're trying to build humor in, 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 in several places. What a great way to pay tribute to someone that you love. I mean, do you feel a lot of pressure, like, I've got to make the Bob Eufer movie now? Yeah, it's a huge amount of pressure, and and it's because for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, I've become very aware of how much he meant to this community. So, so Michigan fans my age and older really know who Bob Eufer is, mm -hmm. and they have fond memories of Bob Eufer. And if you're going to stick your neck out and make a film about Bob Eufer, <laughs> well, of course I understand that it has to be good. I'm just one person telling this story. I think, I think it, will, it will raise the bar. I think it will celebrate his story in a beautiful way. And I think hopefully take away that we can, too, live a kind of life uh, that's filled with enthusiasm, that is a resilient life, uh, that we get back up when we have obstacles, as Bob Eufer did. Um, and, and maintain a, a positive attitude in life. Well, I hope you enjoyed this chat with Dan as much as I did. 
If you want to screen the film at an alumni event, Dan would love to talk to you. Send him a note via the comment section at Michigan Today. And you can hear more Listen in Michigan podcasts at Google Play Music, iTunes, TuneIn, and Stitcher. All right, happy homecoming, Wolverines. Until next time, as always, go Blue.